Okay. For TV. Hmm. I think uh, Robert was going to uh, introduce Ian if I'm, uh, and he just ex uh, messed Cast up. the whole screen. His uh, car is dead, so he oh. is uh, waiting to be rescued. So I can uh, go ahead and do the introduction. Oh, uh, so Ian George. Uh, oh, can other people maybe just mute themselves? Uh, just we're getting quite a bit of background on my end. Um, so Ian George is a molecular biologist with a PhD, and he works at OSP Microcheck with extensive experience in monitoring microbial communities in the oil and gas industry, as well as the emerging world of wastewater-based epidemiology. Ian has hands-on expertise working with many different technologies that are the cornerstone of current diagnostic diagnostic testing from qPCR to next generation sequencing. Ian also has a long history in Calgary's biotech space as a co-founder of FredSense Technologies, as well as contributing to science communication using fluorescent bacterial art through Petri dish Picasso. He is avidly involved in the synthetic biology community through participation in the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition and is currently serving on the engineering committee. And so today Ian's gonna to be sharing a little bit of the work that he's doing with OSP on COVID monitoring in wastewater, which is a really interesting and topical conversation. So I'll pass it over to you, Ian. Great, thanks very much, Emily, for that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, uh, I work at OSP Microcheck. We're an oil and gas services company. Um, that's where we make our bread and butter, mostly looking at microbial problems that people have in the industry around souring. Um, and as the pandemic hit, uh, we kind of realized that a lot of the techniques we were using, a lot of the education we were doing just around microbial problems in oil and gas, um, the same technologies were being used in how we diagnose and deal with COVID. So we started to look at that, and that's what this talk is going to be about today, if it will let me go forward, uh, around the wastewater-based epidemiology side of this universe that we've gotten ourselves involved in. So uh, as a quick overview of uh, my talk, I'm going to give a little bit of background on what COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 is, uh, a little bit about how they measure it clinically, and then I'll jump into the wastewater-based epidemiology side of it. So what is COVID-19? Well, it's a contagious disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, this nasty little guy right here. Um, it's an enveloped single-stranded RNA virus. I don't want you to get worried about the mumbo jumbo of the biology here. We'll get to that in just a second. But the key thing around this is it's the cause of the ongoing pandemic that we see right now. Uh, and what does that really mean? Well, it's changed a lot of the things that we do in our lives. Uh, from ski hills where you can't be anywhere near as crammed in as you might be, uh, to our hospitals having much more uh, load than they normally would, to just differences in how we live our daily lives about maybe not going out to a restaurant, but having to do pickup. So I said that it's an RNA virus. Well, we're gonna step back a little bit and just go over a little bit of basic biology. So DNA is the information storage medium of biology. It's the blueprint of how cells do things. RNA is a molecule that acts as a template. So we convert DNA into RNA and from there it makes things like protein. It can be used as a template to make things like proteins. So again, I said RNA virus. Well, SARS-CoV-2 is kind of interesting. It's genome, so the place where it stores all that information about all the instructions on how it's gonna go and make all of its bits and pieces is stored as RNA, not DNA like our cells do. And this is really important because it affects how we detect for it and how we deal with it. So uh, it uses this linear strand of RNA that it once it, attaches to a cell and gets into the cell, it unpackages all of that and uses that as a template to go and make copies of its genome and go and make all the little proteins that let it do its thing. Then it packages itself back up and is able to release itself. So that's all good and great, but how does that help us diagnose it clinically? Well, there are a number of different techniques that we can go after based off of those biomolecules that make it up. So we can go on the molecular testing side of things and the antigen testing side of things. On the molecular testing, the most common technology that we use right now is called RT-qPCR. This, is, this basically means we're taking that RNA, we're converting it to DNA, and then we're trying to detect that DNA using a tool called polymerase chain reaction. 
The other major way that we use that we do this right now through molecular testing is something called RT LAMP. Uh, this is a similar technology to RTQPCR. It's most commonly used as a rapid test um, in the field. And then the last one that's become more common now is using antigen testing. And this targets a protein in the virus and looks to detect that. So that's all good and great, but why do we have all these different things? Well, they have various different degrees of sensitivity. So RTQPCR is kind of seen as the golden child, the one that is most sensitive, um, and uh, antigen testing is less sensitive. The reason that we use all of these is there's trade-offs to that sensitivity. RTQPCR requires a lab and takes time to do, whereas antigen testing, you can take that swab, you can put it into this lovely little uh, paper uh, assay, and it can give you a result in a few minutes. There's one other thing that's become really important as we've been moving along here, and it's whole genome sequencing. And basically what this is, is we amplify and we, we read out everything that's in that genome so we can make sense of it. From a day-to-day -day perspective, when we're trying to diagnose and understand if somebody has COVID or if there's COVID in there, this is overkill. But when we want to get information about variants and that kind of thing, this is where this information becomes really useful. Um, and a lot of this is getting collected in central databases so that scientists can go ahead and compare the results of what we see in Calgary versus what we see in Vancouver or in London. So I've talked and I've kind of edged towards this, this PCR thing that I was talking about. Um, this is really the backbone of molecular testing and molecular biology as it is. Um, it stands for polymerase chain reaction. And basically this is a tool that lets us take one copy of DNA and make many, many, many copies of it. And going through this, um, basically what happens is we take our first copy, we give it some little primers. So that's these little red guys here. We include some nucleotides, the other pieces that it is, and a polymerase, a thing that can write DNA. And what happens is we go through, we anneal those in a thermocycler. So the temperature goes through a number of different cycles. And we get attachment of those primers, we extend out the piece, the strand, and we make copies. And we make more copies, and we make more copies. And we usually do this over many, many cycles. So in this case, I'm saying 25 total, factoring in all these. And the really important part here is that the amplification is exponential. So after a certain number of cycles, we have lots and lots of DNA that we can use. And that's helpful for us because it means we can measure that amplification. So if you remember back to the days of the early CSI uh, TV series, a lot of them would use gels and that kind of thing. You'd see this really cool banding pattern. And basically what they're trying to measure there is that amplification of DNA. They're trying to understand and see, oh, did I get a band at the right size? With a gel, we can separate it by uh, size. And if we got one at the right size, great. If we didn't, then I guess we need to try it again. But out of that, we've been able to develop a lot of other technologies that actually let us measure the amplification of DNA while we're doing that PCR reaction. One of them is by using a dye that makes its way into the DNA when it gets replicated. And the other is to use a fluorescent probe. And this is the more common one that we see in use today with COVID diagnostics. So, very similar to the, QP, to the PCR that I just showed you, um, but the only difference is now we add in this little probe guy here. And normally, when this guy's just floating around in our mix and our solution, this is attached to what's called a quencher. And effectively, all that means is as, soon as, as long as these two are attached together, you cannot get any light generated. You can't get any fluorescence out of those in the, in the reaction system. But the moment we go through and we start to amplify that DNA signal, this probe will attach at a different point upstream of here and it will separate out. And now that dye is free and able to emit light when we fluoresce that uh, sample. So in this case, we'll get excitation. And just like with the qPCR before, or with the PCR before, we get lots and lots of amplification as we go through the cycles until we see more and more signal going through this. So uh, 
how does this get us to some type of quantitation? Well, when you match this up with our ability to write DNA, to synthesize DNA, we can give that a uh, signal that we know is there's 10 to the nine copies of that gene in there. There's 10 to the three copies of that gene in there. And we can use the signal, the, the cycle threshold. So basically when this amplification starts to go exponential as our measure of, did we detect it or did we not detect it? And where we can base that back to build our standard curve. And using that, if we say have an unknown, so that's the one with the red circles on here, we can say, oh, it turned, it started to go exponential at this point in the curve. That's between the 10 and the 10 to the three version of this. So back calculating, we can say, well, we had 10 to the two copies of that in there. So that gets us to, uh, that's how much DNA is in there and can give us an idea of how much we actually have of maybe COVID that was detected in there. So when we're looking at diagnosing COVID, um, with the molecular testing that I was just talking about, the qPCR, um, we're looking at a specific gene that uh, there's only one copy of that in the genome that uh, COVID carries. So the most typical one that's used these days is the nucleocapsid protein. Basically, this is the little N guy in here, and it helps package up the genome, the RNA that is the at the core of the virus. But We've heard about a lot of other things, these so-called variants of COVID. So the B117s and the 501YV2s. These are uh, different versions of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that spread through the same activities that we take. They seem to have similar to the same mortality and severe out outcomes as the original strain, but they spread much more easily. And why is that? Well, mutations to the spike protein. That's the little guy on the outside, and that's what the cell, what the virus uses to actually get into the cell and infect a person. And what's changed is these different mutations have made it easier for that spike protein to get into the lock effectively of the cell and get a better grapple on there and get inside of the cell. So when we're identifying these variants, um, the first thing we could do is we could just sequence the entire genome. Um, the problem with that is it's very laborious and it would take even longer than doing RTQ-PCR on all of these samples. So we're already doing this and trying to detect the N gene. We can do the exact same thing with the S gene and look for that because of how specific that binding is of those probes and the DNA is for that, uh, that's those specific changes. And this is exactly what they did, for instance, in the UK that enabled them to actually identify that this was what was, that the variant was actually taking hold. Um, they were analyzing for the N gene and they were analyzing for the spike gene. And they noticed that their spike gene uh, probes stopped working because the mutation had made it so that it couldn't bind anymore. And when they correlated that back, they were like, well, this doesn't make sense. We've got all these N genes coming up positive, but all the spike genes are coming up negative. And when they looked and they sequenced in on that, it told them, oh, well, actually, this is something a little different. We have to change our probes and we have to change our detection system. So this brings us to the next big question. When exactly can we detect an infection and when can we detect COVID? Well, the easiest time for us to detect it is when somebody is infectious. The amount of virus that's present for both the low, so these antigenic based tests and the high analytic tests is, uh, is right in this kind of range. The challenge is when you get exposed, there's a lag period where you don't have enough virus in your system for these assays to necessarily give you a detection off of these. It doesn't mean that you won't develop COVID. It just means that you haven't gotten enough of it in your system yet for our assays to detect it. So this really points out one of the challenges that test results are really only one point in time. The other thing is after you're past your infection, so here in Alberta, after you've been 10 days post and you've all cleared up and everything, you're not really considered infectious anymore. And that's based off of a number of different uh, studies that we've done on people who've gone through the course of the disease. Um, but you still may come up positive by a PCR test. So detection of this really depends on what stage the patient is in. So looking at where our diagnostics currently go, we collect a sample, uh, we extract the RNA. So we'll use some type of kit for that. 
And the one thing I kind of skipped over here, we have to take that RNA and we have to turn it in. We have to convert that language into DNA. From there, we can do our qPCR. And if somebody is positive, we will hit above that CT threshold and we'll label them positive. If they don't, then they're negative. So all of that, I know I, I went through that quite quickly, all this stuff on COVID, but into the wastewater side of it. So where does this kind of fit? Well, looking at wastewater gives us a way to uh, touch upon the entire population because everybody has to use the washroom eventually. It's not something completely novel. We've actually used this for understanding the distribution of recreational drug use because the metabolites that are produced from people who are using those drugs end up in the wastewater system. And it's also been used in the worldwide aim to eradicate polio in trying to understand where outbreaks may be occurring that we may not have information about. Um, and the interesting thing with SARS-CoV-2 is it works. It does, it does show up very reliably in wastewater. Um, and we've seen this through a number of different groups that have used it to identify COVID-19. So this, I, I, I swear this is true. The group is called COVID Poops 19. There are a lot of poop chokes in all of this. Um, they're a group of researchers who've gone around and collected as much of the information as they can about who is actually doing this. And there are actually 47 different groups in the world who are publicly releasing data from wastewater treatment plants on how much COVID they're detecting in there. And there are plenty more who are doing this, but are using this and not necessarily completely publicly posting those results on a day-to-day -day basis. So why does this even work though? When we think of COVID, it's a respiratory disease, right? How could it end up in our feces? Well, in our lungs, our cells express a protein called ACE2. ACE2 is that lock that the spike protein uses to bind onto and actually enter into our cells. Interestingly though, that ACE2 protein doesn't just exist in our lungs. It's actually quite prevalent throughout our intestinal tract and in the cells in our intestine. So as time goes on and as somebody gets an infection, some of that uh, SARS-CoV-2 will make it into the lower intestine and it will start to infect those cells and we'll get um, we'll get production of virus. And the really interesting thing about this and what a number of studies have started to look at is that it can actually give us an idea before a patient turns symptomatic or shows up for diagnostic testing that there is that they are infected with COVID, that they will start shedding that before then. So looking back at our curve of when people are infectious and when they're producing a lot of viral load, what we find is that there's actually, before they'll show up enough viral load through a swab, they'll actually start to show some amount of virus in their feces that we can detect. So this brings up the next question, where exactly should we be looking in the wastewater treatment system? Should we be looking at uh, a wastewater treatment plant? That's great. It could give us a citywide scale and give us an understanding of what's going on in a city. But the challenge there is it doesn't really help us necessarily with hotspots, um, especially if we're already challenged with testing. So there's a lot of opportunity here to move upstream of the wastewater system and actually try and catch those hotspots in there. The big question and the, the big question mark comes down to where are people actually using the washroom? If they only ever use the washroom at home, then you might miss it if you're only, if you're only doing your testing at an industrial park. So this is a huge part of the actual detection side. Do we do households, communities? Do we do businesses? Do we do wastewater treatment plants? Or do we do some combination of all of these in one of these detection schemes? So shifting gears a little bit, the Canadian Water Network is one of the groups that's been working at a lot of the problems around this. And the early things that people realized when the pandemic kind of hit and they wanted to do wastewater treatment was, we need to set a lot of the best practices and understand that. So they performed an interlab and they identified a number of different factors that needed to be thought about when you wanna spin up a wastewater based epidemiology system for COVID. You need a standard curve. You need to think about inhibition control. So things that might prevent the, uh, the ways you're gonna detect that from working, looking for fecal indicators so that you know that you actually have that in there and process controls. 
And just speaking to a couple of those, the big, big one in here is that we use our wastewater treatment plant for a lot more than just things that go down the toilet. There's showers, there's uh, car washes that will end up with a lot of that water going in there. And there's just things that go down your sink. So there's a lot of other components that we may have to deal with. And it also raises a question, how do we know that we actually have a representative sample in these? Well, science, back to this, somebody went through and they tried to detect all the different viruses and things that they could look and see in there. And one of the things that they identified was something called the pepper mild model virus. It's a plant pathogen that's prevalent in human feces. Um, it just ends up in there. And it's something that reliably ends up at ends up throughout the wastewater treatment system. So we can use that as a kind of baseline measure of, okay, we have this much of it in the actual wastewater treatment plant. And that's a good surrogate for how much human feces might be in there. Another big question around all of this is how do we actually collect samples? So the first thing you could do is you could just go with a bottle out into a wastewater treatment plant or to, a, to one of the sewage uh, manholes and you could collect a sample. But the problem with that is it's only one point in time. As I was saying before, we use our wastewater treatment plant for a lot of different things. Um, so it could have been that somebody had just washed, a whole bunch of people had just washed their cars, but nobody had gone to the washroom. So you grab at the wrong time and you miss that sample because you're not, you're not constantly sampling that. That's where composite sampling. So automated samplers that you put in there, they have a little tube that goes down into the waste stream and automatically pulls a small amount of that water over a period of time and collects it in a bottle. Um, the biggest challenge with this is it can actually be quite challenging, especially when you go upstream of the system um, to actually find the right spot to detect it and try and collect. Plumbing plans don't usually match up. One of our colleagues that we're working with at CEC Analytics has experienced this on many occasions where a plumbing diagram has said that there's clearly a trap that he can grab water from and there is no trap to be seen. Um, just showing here, this is some of the different waters and the water, what, what it looks like when it comes through there. So another challenge is we're generally dealing with large volumes. So often we'll receive one, two liters of liquid that we're, we're needing to work with. The challenge is it needs to end up in like a five microliter. So five one hundredths or five one thousandths of, of uh, milliliters worth of liquid into our actual reaction when we're doing qPCR. So we need to use tools to concentrate or bring that down without losing the virus. The other challenge is Wastewater just has a lot of stuff in it. It's a complex matrix. So this was another early challenge that people kind of faced off. There are a lot of different ways that we could kind of approach this. A lot of them come, to, come from the world of research and protein purification. We've been playing around with ultrafiltration and using these filters that basically let the water go through but trap anything that is the size of a viral particle in the membrane so we can collect that and actually go and analyze that. And it works really, really well. The problem comes in supply chain. And this has been the bane of every scientist's existence throughout the entire pandemic. All the things that we use were predominantly used in small scale for uh, research use or were used in uh, health labs, but not at the scale that we're talking about. Uh, one of the companies out there was literally at the point where they were advertising that if you had one of these automation tools and weren't really totally utilizing it, they would buy it back from you at a pretty decent rate so that they could go and sell it to a testing lab so that they could spin up more capacity just to be able to get enough tests done. So this has been one of the bigger challenges in spinning up any type of uh, analysis. And this is one that we've experienced as we've tried to spin up wastewater epidemiology. A lot of it comes down to getting really, really good about having diverse supply chains. So speaking to some examples of what wastewater-based epidemiology and where it's been used, it really kind of kicked off with two groups. The first was in the Netherlands. Um, they looked at six different water treatment plants and they actually tracked uh, their wastewater from having no detectable COVID in it to starting to see some considerable amounts that were present in it into, uh, into March. The same was down in, done down in Australia. 
Um, and they started again in late February. They had access to wastewater. Um, they were able to detect it. But they were one of the first that kind of pitched this as, well, maybe this could be a great early warning system for actually trying to detect this and informing what public health is doing. Uh, New York City came on a little bit later in the pandemic, and they wanted to do this all in-house. Um, there was some great actual reporting from a number of different news groups that kind of went in and saw what they were doing. And it was really interesting. They, uh, they were totally on board with this early warning side of things. Um, and... Wow. This is so nice in here. Thanks, a lot. Beautiful shot. Thanks, man. We'll put a lot of work into making this shot. You could just uh, mute your microphone, please. Yeah. I risked it all once with this business. Yeah. Now I feel like we're starting over, risking it all again right. with our house. And that's why I called you to like help me out and so I can like be a responsible human being. You know, it was when you were starting your business. So yeah. Like when so, you um, I had to work 24 7. Yeah. He had to be on a job site morning, noon, and night. Since the beginning, he was always by my side. Every house bill finally came to a point where I promised him that he would no longer have to live and drive all dust. Uh, yeah. Here, I'll carry on. So in the uh, in uh, the later yeah. part of 2020, um, what we saw was uh, that in Connie Island, they were actually starting to see an increase in the amount of coronavirus that they were detecting at the wastewater treatment plant. This was before they were actually starting to see this at a... So I muted you, Ian. You'll have to unmute because I could only unmute all. Yeah, uh, here. There we go. Sounds yep, good. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. I'll just go over that again. So New York uh, City, they decided with all of their different uh, wastewater treatment plants that they were going to, oh, that they were going to uh, apply this across their system and try and detect. And uh, what they found was uh, that in late 2020, they started to see increasing rates of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater, uh, particularly in the Connie Island area. Public health hadn't picked up upon this though yet. And what it enabled the city to do was say, hey, public health, we're seeing um, an increase in this here. You guys should see if there are things you can do in the community, go out there and try and detect um, this virus and see if you can be more proactive. And they did that and they were actually, they, what they found is that they did start to see a spike, but they were able to take action before uh, before it had really even started to become apparent to them what was going on. Um, Ottawa, getting a little closer to home, is one of the few that actually completely publicly releases their data on a regular basis. Um, so you can go on to their website, 613covid.ca, and you can see the mean amount of virus that they are detecting in their wastewater. And they compare it against the number of case counts that they see here. And the really interesting thing here was this same thing that they were seeing in other parts that it could be an early warning was seen here in a number of cases where they would see a bit of a spike in the amount of virus that was present in there before they would see a spike in the number of reported cases in people that were being tested. But one of the other parts that they found very useful and very informative was that on the downward trend, if they started to see a consistent downward trend after they'd been through a spike, they could use that to confirm that it wasn't the, that if they weren't getting as many people coming back and they weren't getting as many positive cases, that this was actually real, that they were seeing a reduction in cases and that their, uh, their actions were being effective. So this kind of gave them another piece of information to say, yes, we're doing the right thing and yes, we're on the right track or maybe we're not. It gives you, that trend information gives you a lot of information about where you might be going and where you've been. So the other place that this has been used in Canada is up in the North. This has been a pinnacle of their early warning system as a mechanism to watch out in communities to see if it's established. The North's been pretty effective at keeping COVID cases down um, so it means that there's not a heck of a lot necessarily in the wastewater system. But uh, as recently as in uh, December and in January, um, they started to detect cases of it in the wastewater. And this was a signal to them in public health that they needed to go out into the community and say, okay, we're gonna go and do a mass testing scheme to see if we can detect those cases and try and stop them in their tracks before this builds into something. So really what it comes down to is it's the, the trend that is most useful, most important here. 
Uh, monitoring regularly gives us something that we can look at and say, oh yes, well, we're kind of middling along, we're doing well, or we're going down, or we're going way back up. Um, those no detection to de detection thing uh, signals, so like what they saw in Yellowknife can be very useful. Um, massive increases like they saw in Connie Island can be very useful as well. So the biggest challenge with all of this is it's a heck of a lot of communication between a heck of a lot of different stakeholders. Um, policymakers, public health, sanitation, scientists, people in industry. This is bringing together a lot of different people who didn't necessarily talk together, have a lot of different responsibilities, expertise, and goals. So the, the biggest challenge in implementing these types of tools is just getting everybody on the same page and getting people communicating. So with that, I know it's a bit abrupt, but that's my presentation and I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks, Ian. Um, is it too impolite to ask how a vaccine works? I can give a stab at it. I am, uh, <laughs> I'm not an MD in any regard, but um, Effectively, what we're trying to do there is we're trying to teach your immune system how to respond to something new. So in the case of COVID, um, uh, you may have heard a lot of these mRNA viruses or mRNA vaccines, sorry. Um, basically, what they're doing is they're taking a little tiny piece of that, um, of that viral genome. It's usually the spike protein. And we're... Uh, introducing that into your cells so they'll express that so that your immune system will learn that that's bad. That's not, that's something I want to react against and give you immunity against. Okay, so that's uh, the thing like the Pfizer and the Moderna, but what, mm -hmm. what, what does the um, Oxford AstraZeneca one do? If memory serves, um, those are more protein based. So rather than giving you the, the mRNA, the, the, your cells, the way to make that and, and produce that, they will be giving uh, some of those proteins. So they'll take the virus, they'll grow it up, they'll break it all down, make it so that it's not infectious um, and uh, break out just the specific part that they want to show to your immune system and give you that. And the goal there is that you're going to get, uh, you're going to, again, your immune system is going to notice that, see that that's bad. It's not something that should be in your body and it will grow up a specific response to that. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, any other questions, anybody? Uh, can I ask, um, <clears throat> many decades ago, we used to work on analyzers for all sorts of things, uh, up to grass chromatographs. I found it amazing that with the fear, I mean, when they do the sample for DNA uh, testing from your blood or your nasal, it's pretty clean compared to what's in the sewer. How do you manage to filter out? There must be a huge amount of noise and garbage in there. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question. The the really cool thing about um, all of this is, first off, we uh, when we're doing that extraction, we'll usually use a column of some kind. It's a little tiny guy, but you'll run that liquid through there. And the goal there is to separate out as much of the garbage, the 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 background. Uh, information and just get the RNA out of there. So all the different things that might be present. Um, and then from there, when we're actually detecting it and testing it, that uh, the process of PCR is very, very specific. Um, so those primers are designed in such a way that they will only bind to that specific sequence um, that you're interested in and yeah. actually give you amplification. So that as well, combined with the pre-processing can give you a very, very clean signal and very clean results. I mean, I mean assume there are even animal viruses in there, right? In the yeah, exactly. It's, it's that specific that it can differentiate. So like um, the original SARS, COVID, uh, SARS virus from 2003, um, these primers, those viruses, this one and that one, they're, they're different, but they have a lot of similarities. Um, but they've been able to design the primers that they're specific only for the new version of SARS and not the old version of SARS. Is that, that's how specific you can get with it. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, any other questions? Yeah, <clears throat> this is Sally Jones. So excuse me if this sounds a stupid question because I'm not a scientist and I'm not an engineer. But looking at the graph on the 
kind of positivity found in the wastewater. It seemed there were higher numbers than actual new cases. So is that a possible indication that there are many people out there with no symptoms and therefore not being tested and not included in the new cases number? It's a great question. So the, the two axes here are literally overlap just for convenience sake. So uh, I wouldn't read too much into them both being overlapped in that sense. I think when it comes to the wastewater side of it, it's really hard to be able to go back from a sample at a wastewater treatment plant to one specific person because you don't know how much they're shedding and that kind of thing. But what can be really useful in this instance is just the trend information. So if you go from no COVID in the wastewater to a lot of it present, then that's giving you a signal that, oh, okay, something's changed in the environment. There may be cases that we haven't detected if we haven't detected them through our traditional means. And that's a signal to public health that maybe we need to go out into the community and try and uh, trace down these people. Maybe they're so sick that they haven't been able to go to a testing center, or maybe they just thought it was a cold or that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ian, Hugh Stewart, I, I had one question in regards to uh, this uh, ability to identify uh, likely trends early. And I wondered uh, if there's been any work on uh, more specifically locating, looking at uh, locations where people are at high risk, for instance, long-term care homes, that kind of thing. Uh, you, you've covered sort of uh, large areas, but is there more targeted uh, assessments either been done or planned? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. So the easiest one has obviously been in the lowest hanging fruit has been just go to the wastewater treatment plant and grab a sample there. Um, there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of different groups out there who are actively trying to go after hospitals, long term care facilities, uh, all these different areas where we know there's really high risk if COVID gets in there to be monitoring that on a regular basis. Um, the biggest challenge is a lot of these are, uh, are, are spinning up as academic studies right now. So um, we won't hear about them for a little bit is what I would say. Going back to the sample, I assume there's no way you could sort of fully automate this and just run a, a stream through an analyzer and it would give you an ongoing reading all the time. The biggest challenge with that is just how complex wastewater is. Yeah, um, this is one of the things that we kind of we kind of learned. <clears throat> we deal with a lot of really uh, difficult to deal with water from the oil and gas industry. And we've come up with a lot of different strategies on, okay, well, we're not really getting good signal out of this. What can we do to get better signal or better understand that? And the challenge is it, it's just really hard to build a device okay. that can do that out in the field rather than having a laboratory to, to <laughs> toy around. Yeah. So if you look on chat, Ian, there's, a, there's um, a question from Andy Lamb there saying, can people get infected when the wastewater has got virus in it? So I'm interpreting that to say, if people in Banff have it and their wastewater gets into the bow and the it comes down the river and we pick it up in Calgary, could somebody in Calgary be infected that way? I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, so the question of just how infective things are from the wastewater is something that's been uh, from day one with this, uh, with researchers wondering how can I how hand, how can I handle this safely. Um, the first thing I would say is any the the stuff that's going through wastewater treatment plants is quite effective at actually knocking down and removing uh, the virus from there. Um, there, the second thing I would say is that we haven't seen any cases that have been directly linked to wastewater. So it doesn't seem to be a primary way that we would see transmission happening. Okay, uh, but, but could you get it from drinking water is, I mean, because they have cases in what they call community spread, where they have no way of understanding where that person got infected. Could it be coming through the water? I don't think so because when we process water, the first thing we do is we chlorinate it when it's coming in into any of the municipal water systems that we have. So we do treatment on there. And I just think it's very, very unlikely that that would be the case. So chlorine, kill, chlorine kills it, doesn't it? It does. It's, it's a very effective way to destroy it. Yeah, but don't drink chlorine, Bob. No, do not. <laughs> I used to work at a chlorine plant. 
Yeah, none of us are Donald Trump. Uh, any other questions? Something not directly to this. How toxic is this, say, compared to things like the Black Death or bubonic plague? You know, they, they, even the one, the 1918 uh, flu, is it? Do they compare those or not? It's a different situation. I just wondered if uh, you can rate the toxicity of it. That's a tough one. I, uh, I don't know if I can totally speak to that guy. I think um, it's obviously having a significant impact and it is spreading and it does cause a lot of harm. I think the challenge of uh, comparing that to previous outbreaks, uh, that's one for the history books when we're through this whole thing. So, I mean, so, some of these plagues in Europe killed a third of the population, right? And mm -hmm. They were untreated, but even so, it was a massive... Yeah, we do have the benefit that we have public health um, yes. and that we have a lot of these other tools to help mitigate uh, the, the challenges of the virus. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, Ian, I, I noticed there was a high degree of surveillance in, in Turkey when you brought up the world map, but yeah. very little, very, very little reporting, public reporting. Do you have any insight on, on you know, why that's occurring and what they're doing with that information? I honestly don't. I looked at that and I was a bit surprised because I haven't really been reading in on what's been happening in Turkey. Um, a lot of these reports, when it comes to the reported sites, uh, these guys that they're picking up is from news reports. So um, uh, I can't really speak more to it other than it's fascinating that they're, uh, they're really diving into this. Okay. Interesting. Last calls, any more questions? Well, in, in the case that there's no more questions, Ian, um, I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of the group for giving the presentation because I think it's a very difficult subject to talk to non-biologic engineers. Um, oh, it's it's, not, not it's speaking, quite not. difficult for you to present that, but yeah. it was very informative and very helpful. And um, the Prairie Group of Chartered Engineers is going to make or has made a donation to Operation Eyesight in your name, and we will get you the certificate eventually. Uh, we will show the name of somebody who has received Eyesight because you took the time to give this, this presentation today. So thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, that's wonderful. Thank you, Ian, that was fantastic. It was fantastic, thank you much indeed. Thank you. Really good. Great, Great. have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Really, really impressed. That was good. <laughs> Never look at poop in the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>